Good morning, everyone, and, and welcome to St. Francis Hospital. My name uh, is Tom Burke, and I am the president at St. Francis. Uh, please accept my welcome to our community members, our colleagues, and our honored guests in attendance today. We're honored to welcome Governor Ned Lamont to St. Francis today in order to focus our efforts around bringing attention to the ongoing devastation caused by gun violence. Uh, I want to say a special thank you to our local community and state leaders who are here with us today, many of them partnering with us on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, Andrew Woods and Johanna Schubert of Hartford Communities That Care, Jackie Santiago, Compass Youth Collaborative, Jeremy Stein, Connecticut Against Gun Violence, Paul Murray and Carol Wakeman, Newtown Action Alliance, Kristen and Mike Song of the Ethan Miller Song Foundation, Deborah Davis of Mothers United Against Violence, and Commissioner Jim Ravella. Thank you all for joining us here today. As we know, gun violence happens all too often, and, and just this week, uh, our country has mourned several mass shootings, uh, with three of them in Connecticut taking the lives of, of 20 innocent individuals. We know that gun violence deeply affects our communities and our neighbors right here in Hartford, and we stand here today with our partners and organizations who are committed to ending the scourge of gun violence. For each victim of gun violence, there are others directly and indirectly affected. Mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, children, grandchildren, cousins, classmates, friends, and, and many, many others. We offer our deepest sympathies to all those who have suffered losses, and, and we stand with our local and national leaders who are here with us today, committed to making an impact, to making a change. We offer our hope that just as we are standing here in unity, the nation will come together against this ongoing public health crisis. I would now like to welcome to the podium the Lieutenant Governor. Thank you so much, Tom. Good morning, everyone. It is an honor to be here with Governor Lamont and our partners that have gathered here today to help us announce a proposal which we believe uh, will help us eliminate gun violence. In Connecticut, every year, 185 people die by gun violence. And 576 people in our state are wounded by guns. In the United States, nearly 50 people have, are killed each year by a firearm. And so every day, I'm so sorry, in our country, yeah, I wish it was that, in our country, 53 people are killed each day. And we're not even a month into 2023, and here we are with 39 mass shootings in our country already. So today, we are here to say that it is time to update our assault weapon ban, which is almost 10 years old. We're not worried about the guns that are stored in people's homes under lock and key, but we do want to stop the continued proliferation of weapons in our state. Our proposal addresses three different categories of assault weapons, other firearms, which we'll talk about, pre-ban firearms, and rim fire rifles. We are proposing that any resident must be 21 to buy guns and not just handguns. People who are under 21 under our proposal may, must still have a permit for long guns, but they may not purchase them. High capacity magazines. Our proposal uh, about high capacity magazines is this. Our proposal would make it a class D felony across the board to possess 
unregistered, high-capacity magazine guns, replacing a $90 first offense infraction. Our 2013 law that established the modern Connecticut assault weapon ban left a few categories of weapons completely unregulated. The largest exception is any weapon manufactured before September 13th, 1994. We call those pre-ban weapons. Pre-ban weapons, including AR-style rifles, are legal to be sold, possessed, carried in the, same, in the state, whether or not they have forward pistol grips, flash suppressors, muzzle guards, or other banned features under our 2013 law. This is the next, uh, the next uh, pr proposal that we have is other weapons. It's a category that attempts to evade the 2013 law through a loophole. The 2013 law regulates only pistols, rifles, and shotguns. These categories that are defined under Connecticut law and they don't include all weapons. The last is the rimfire rifles, a category of weapons that are typically used for hunting but have begun to be customized into more assault weapon style rifles to evade bans like ours here in Connecticut. For all of these, our proposal is to allow anyone who currently possesses one of those guns to continue to do so, much like in 2013, we're gonna set up a one-time registration period that allows people to continue to possess and carry any weapons they already have but did not buy, sell, or otherwise transfer them. These are our proposals. Gun violence, as we've said, is killing 53 people every day in our country. It's uh, an all too frequent tragedy here in our state, and it's an epidemic specific to our country. And so we have always been a leader in gun safety issues, and so today we present our proposal to our state legislature. All the pieces to our proposal are common sense uh, pieces, and uh, we are here today with advocates who have helped us make Connecticut a leader, uh, and we appreciate their continued support and advocacy, and uh, thank you so much, and it is my pleasure to introduce Chief State's Attorney, Pat Griffin. Good morning. Get my notes. It's an honor to be here today. Thank you. It's an honor to be here today and stand with the governor, lieutenant governor, our partners in the community as we attempt to prevent the scourge of gun violence. Uh, as a prosecutor of some 27 years, I've seen firsthand the devastation that gun violence has wrecked, uh, and particularly in our urban uh, communities. As a state's attorney in New Haven for six years, year after year, we saw the nauseating consistency of gun violence. Last year alone, over 110 individuals in the city of New Haven were shot uh, and seriously injured. Um, I appreciate the opportunity as the Chief State's Attorney to, subject, to say a few words today regarding the high capacity magazine statute that is currently in law. Uh, current law prohibits that any person who possesses a large capacity magazine that was obtained prior to April, April 5th of 2013 is guilty of an infraction with a maximum penalty of $90 for the first offense and for a subsequent offense uh, it is a class D felony. Um, and for a magazine that was uh, obtained after April 5th, uh, 2014, or January of 2014, it would be a Class D felony. Effectively, that statute is unenforceable as prosecutors in, within the state of Connecticut. And the reason is simple. We cannot determine with any degree of accuracy when a high-capacity magazine was purchased or obtained. And therefore, when we recover high-capacity magazines at crime scenes over and over and over again, it is virtually impossible for us 
within the Division of Criminal Justice as prosecutors to pursue those charges. On the street, high capacity magazines are referred to as ladders. And that's because they look, when they stick out of a, a semi-automatic handgun, like a ladder. As recently as last night, I had an opportunity to speak with an ATF agent to, dis to, to discuss the increase in the number of crime scenes here in Connecticut where we are seeing shots fired of 30 and 40 rounds. Crime scene analysis is determining that those shots are being fired by, from single firearms and pistol uh, caliber. So what does that mean? It means that we are seeing an increase in the use of what's referred to as a Glock switch. A Glock switch is a, is a uh, a jerry-rigged uh, um, piece of metal or plastic that it turns a semi-automatic handgun into a fully automatic handgun. And when you, come, when you take that semi-automatic handgun with a Glock switch and marry it up with a high-capacity magazine, you have a highly uh, portable, concealable, fully automatic machine gun. And I will say to you this, in speaking to the ATF agent last night, that we are seeing uh, these switches being used uh, and able to take a 15 round high capacity magazine to a 30 round high capacity magazine and empty that magazine in, in less than 1.5 seconds. That is, in my opinion as the Chief State's Attorney, um, a, uh, an issue that poses an extreme danger to public safety. So again, I, I stand with the Governor and the Lieutenant Governor and the people behind us uh, trying to come up with strategies to prevent tragedies, uh, to prevent the, the, the violence that we've seen year after year. So I thank you uh, for your attention. Uh, thank, thank you. Please join me in welcoming now to the podium Hartford Mayor Luke Bronin. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Governor, Lieutenant Governor, you and your teams for putting this proposal forward. And I want to also start by saying thank you to St. Francis, to the doctors and nurses at St. Francis, who, uh, like our other hospitals in this city, see all too often the horror of gun violence. They see what bullets do to human bodies. They save lives, and sometimes they don't save lives because the damage is too horrific. And the proposals that the governor rolled out earlier this week, combined with the proposals today, make a difference. We're not talking about distant theoretical issues. As Chief State's Attorney just said, we are seeing these weapons used in our community. We're seeing bodies torn apart because of high capacity magazines combined with Glock switches. There's no reason to have a high capacity magazine unless you have it to enable yourself to, in, to inflict maximum damage on your target. And although we often talk about assault weapon bans or high capacity magazine bans as aimed at the horror of mass shootings, and they do make a difference in trying to stop or at least mitigate the damage of mass shootings, it's also about stopping the kind of violence that devastates our community here in this city and in cities across our state and across our country. High capacity magazines are showing up on a regular basis in the gun crimes committed in our communities. Just like ghost guns are showing up on a regular basis in the crimes committed in our communities. So I applaud the governor and all the partners and the advocates and the legislators who are part of putting this proposal together and standing together today in support of them. Uh, in the week ahead, uh, there are, I think will be additional announcements of some other changes that we can make together to make sure that there are serious consequences when someone violates these laws. But making clear that no matter when you bought or came to obtain a high capacity magazine, you've had almost a decade to register it. If you've got a capacity magazine that isn't registered, there is no lawful purpose to owning it. And if you've got a weapon that's designed to evade the common sense restrictions on assault weapons that you haven't registered, no good can come from that. So thank you again, Governor. Thanks to all of the members of this coalition that have worked to 
put these ideas together and to put them forward today and look forward to working together to enact them into law. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we will now ask uh, to step to the podium uh, State Representative Steve Staffstrom, who is the co-chair of the Judiciary Committee. Thank you, everybody, and, and certainly thank you to uh, St. Francis for hosting us and, and for all the advocates behind us who really uh, have been tireless for a number of years here in Connecticut in making sure that Connecticut is one of the national leaders in gun safety. Um, but they know, as well as I and the governor, we have not done enough. Uh, despite the fact that Connecticut has established itself as a national leader in gun safety legislation and, and frankly are a state that we wish other states would model and, and to many extents has modeled, uh, we continue to see the scourge of gun violence. You know, um, I woke up this morning, as I do most mornings, to a text message, um, a police reports that I get from the Bridgeport Police Department of, of shots fired, assault with a deadly weapon again last night in Bridgeport. Two people shot here in Hartford, two 16-year-old kids shot mere blocks from here last night in the city of Hartford. It continues to affect us here in Connecticut, and it continues to be a uniquely American problem. If you look at the rate of gun violence and gun death here in America versus every other civilized nation in the world, we are off the charts, absolutely off the charts in a bad way. More guns, more gun violence, more deaths. And that's what we're standing here today and what we were standing uh, in Waterbury for earlier this week is to begin to roll out a very robust package that will be the priority for the Judiciary Committee this year and frankly should be the priority for the entire legislature this year is, is how do we make our state, state safer? How do we get some of these weapons, if not off our streets, make sure that they are fully registered when it comes to assault weapons? and make sure that these high-capacity magazines are being, uh, are being properly uh, prosecuted when we find them. Think about it, a $90 fine for possessing a, a, a weapon that is able to kill dozens of people at a single time, $90? If you pass a school bus, it's a $390 fine. I got a parking ticket here in Hartford, Mayor, not too long ago. I think I paid $90 for my parking ticket. $90? It's outrageous. And, and also, the other piece to this proposal that we have not talked a ton about is increasing the age to 21 to purchase all handguns. You know, in Connecticut, you can't buy cigarettes under the age of 21. You can't buy cannabis under the age of 21. But you can buy a hand, but you can buy a, a long arm rifle. Seriously, it's time this changes, and it's time this changes this year. Thank you, Governor, for putting these forward. Thank you, and I'd now like to invite to the podium and introduce Jackie Haggerty from Sandy Hook, Connecticut, who will say a few words with us this morning. Hi everyone, thank you for having me. And thank you Governor Lamont for introducing this gun violence prevention agenda. My name is Jackie Hegarty and I'm a survivor of the Sandy Hook school shooting from 2012. I was in second grade. I stand here representing my community and the organizations I am a part of, the Newtown Action Alliance and the Junior Newtown Action Alliance. I've seen the devastation that gun violence causes and I know what it's like to face tragedy. Anyone who's experienced something this traumatic agrees this cannot continue to happen. No one deserves to lose a loved one, to grieve, to become traumatized. Gun violence not only holds a heavy economic burden, but an emotional burden. At times it feels hopeless, but giving up won't help. We cannot become desensitized to gun violence. This cannot be normalized, and there's no reason why people should live in fear. After Sandy Hook, Connecticut set an example to the nation that stronger policies and Second Amendment rights can coexist. And we know that common sense gun laws have worked in past years. 
With that being said, every piece of legislation has loopholes. But if our policies have worked to decrease gun violence, let's continue to revise them. Let's make them better. I'm very grateful to Governor Mott for introducing these proposals, especially when guns are now the number one killer of children in America. And nearly 49,000 Americans are killed by guns every year. So again, thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Jackie, for, for being here with us this morning. Uh, I now want to welcome Dr. Stephanie Montgomery. She is our Chief of Trauma and Acute Care Surgery at St. Francis Hospital. Dr. Montgomery. I'm glad she didn't say anything that would make a person cry, because she certainly probably could. Um, thank you, Tom. Ladies and gentlemen and distinguished guests, welcome to St. Francis Hospital. I am Dr. Stephanie Montgomery, and I'm the Chief of the Division of Trauma and Acute Care Surgery, and proud to be the Vice Chair of Surgery. Today, I'd like to ask us all to stop and take a moment to reflect on the fact that there have been over 3,000 Americans shot this year alone. This year alone. So that means 26 days into 2023, and 3,000 Americans have been shot. As a trauma surgeon, I've seen firsthand what gun violence can do. I've lost count of the number of people I have seen in our trauma bays devastated by these wounds. And still, every time it happens, you stand at the bottom of bed and wonder why. As a surgeon, but even more so as a community member and a mother, I am furious that we continue to see shootings across this country every day. I'm horrified that every time there's a new headline about any mass shooting, something that happens far too often, we seem desensitized to it. Oh, it's another one. Our children, who are accustomed to shooting drills in school, are still more likely to die of a gunshot wound than any other reason at all. This does not need to happen. We know that there are things that can be done to stop this. I am really proud to live in Connecticut, where we are taking the lead on issues related to gun violence. I thank our leaders all the time, like Governor Lamont, Senator Murphy, and Blumenthal, as well as our community partners that are standing with us today, who continue to fight to make legislation a priority for all of us. I implore everyone in the room to keep fighting, to keep Connecticut at the forefront of strong gun legislation with the hopes of leading the way to a safer life across this country. And on behalf of the trauma team here at St. Francis, we will all continue to stand with you who are affected by this issue with the knowledge that we know that gun violence is preventable. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Montgomery, and it now gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, back to the podium at St. Francis, Governor Ned Lamont. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm here with folks who have been touched by gun violence, uh, here with folks that, like Stephanie, um, and the trauma unit here at St. Francis, uh, taking the lead and doing what we can to help people who have been hit by gun violence. And I'm afraid our deaths would be even higher if it wasn't for our amazing hospitals like St. Francis and all the incredible work you do. Um, is even last night. <laughs> and the folks here with us who do everything we can to make sure that um, those weapons don't fall in the hands of those that would do bad by them, likely to pull a trigger, and hopefully those that we can keep them out of harm's way. I was struck listening, you know, to a couple of things. One, I just want to remind people, our gun safety laws are pretty effective. You know, we, um, we're not as good, Steve, as, as Europe, but um, look at us compared to a lot of those southern states. Um, they are making a difference. But we are here today because you got to continue to modernize what we're trying to do because there's a lot of gun peddlers out there who are trying to sell these things and trying to work around our system every day. And um, you see that by the fact that um, 
they go out and buy assault weapons pre-1994 and say, I'm going to get them in some southern state, I'll bring them here to Connecticut, and I can sell them legally. Well, not any longer. Uh, not, not on our watch. You see, as you heard um, Luke and Pat describe how you can make adjustments to some legal weapons and turn them into machine guns. And uh, not if we can get this law passed, ways that we can keep people safer. Um, you know, imagine if uh, Texas had said you can't buy these weapons until you're 21 years old. You know, maybe if all they wouldn't have happened. I was struck uh, listening to Steve saying, you know, you can have one of these uh, assault weapons and it's the $90 fine. Um, back after the, I've been around for a long time, back after the St. Patrick's Day, uh, St. Valentine's Day massacre, uh, Franklin Roosevelt put a $2,000 fee in order to get what were then referred to as machine guns uh, off the street. Um, it was Ronald Reagan, it was Governor Ronald Reagan who said, why in God's name are people carrying loaded weapons on public streets? His point of view changed over time. But it's just a reminder that as the world changes, we got to change every day. That's what these gun safety rules are about. That's what 21 years of age is all about. That's what it means to strengthen um, you know, some of the end arounds that make um, these weapons into assault style weapons and dangerous. It, um, it builds on what we did just a few days ago when it means getting those um, ghost guns. Ghost guns are meant there to evade the law and they're meant to kill and they're very tough for Pat Griffin and our state police and municipal police to track them down. Get them off the street. That's what we're trying to do. That's what we're trying to make sure that um, every day you try and make a little progress. You know, progress is not a straight line. But every day you got to work at it. I think Connecticut is going to make progress today, and I want Connecticut to continue to take the lead, not after it's too late, but right now it can still make a big difference. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you, Governor. That concludes the speaking portion of our program this morning. We are happy to take some, some brief questions. Thank you. Tell me a little bit about you. You have a lot of uh, groups here, et cetera, et cetera. Tell me uh, about the, the coalition that you're trying to build. In other words, on the other side, you're going to have fairly organized opponents who don't feel that there should be uh, any more restrictions or that Connecticut has enough restrictions. So take me through how you're going to um, try to build a coalition to get these things done that you're talking about. Yeah, so I, I think it's I think it's it starts obviously with a public hearing, which the Judiciary Committee will uh, do likely sometime in March uh, after we get the formal bill proposals in in February, um, and looking at each of these proposals individually. I think, as the Lieutenant Governor alluded to, break them down. They're all common sense, right? I mean, is somebody really going to say it's okay to buy? It's okay to buy a long gun, but not to buy cigarettes if you're 20 years old. I mean, if they want to fight that fight, if they want to make that argument, I'm, ha I'm happy to argue it. Um, you know, if they want to sit there and say, oh, you know, well, if somebody had 10 years to register their high capacity magazine but didn't do it, even after we give, we've given them 10 years to do it, that, yeah, just pay a $90 fine, no big deal, we'll, we'll forget about it. I mean, go through these one by one. Right? They are common sense proposals, um, and I think between the support we've seen from our mayors earlier this week, the state's attorney, um, legislators, and community activists around the state of Connecticut, uh, this should be a, a bill that um, everybody can rally around this year, I certainly hope, because you know, we've heard a lot over the last couple of years about public safety, and public safety is paramount. Well, Connecticut is one of the absolute safest states in the country, but we continue to struggle, just like every other state does, with an epidemic of gun violence, and particularly um, youth gun violence, as, as we saw here in, in Hartford last night. So if folks really want to focus on public safety, if they really want to make our state safer, hit a green button and vote yes on these proposals. And I just want to add to that, uh, Chris, um, two-thirds of the people in our country and two-thirds of the people in our state support
common sense gun safety measures. And we've outlined why each of these are very common sense, especially making sure that high capacity magazines, which allow for a military style weapon, should be banned under this proposal. The other thing I want to add is we have a record number of women that have been elected to our state legislature who got there because they support gun safety measures like these. Yeah, and Chris, and Chris, the only other thing on that is, remember, we've seen a lot of bipartisan gun legislation pass over the last several years. When we banned bump stocks, I think the vote in the House was something like 125 to 25. The first ghost gun ban we did was overwhelmingly bipartisan. This does not have to be a partisan fight. So, Chris Murphy talks in terms of the, the long kind of arc of history on gun control, and he points to the passage of, in the Senate, finally, of a federal gun control bill. So what is your assessment of what has been the shift politically? Ten years ago, the passage of the Hook Law, uh, it was bipartisan, but it was arduous in getting it there. So this is a little bit more, not a little bit, this is more ambitious than the bump stock. This is more ambitious than some of these single items, the ghost gun. So again, give us your assessment of why the, why you believe, and the governor, I'd like you to also answer, why you believe the time is right for a more ambitious approach to further uh, gun safety laws. Go ahead. Well, first of all, to, to Chris's comment, um, how do you build a coalition? It's no problem building a coalition after a tragedy. Everybody comes up. We're here because we want to avoid that next tragedy. And, uh, I, and we, we've, we've suffered as a, a state. We've been through uh, tragedies like that. And, for, and remind people, um, Every day, there are ongoing tragedies, um, especially in our cities, of kids getting killed. So to your point, you know, Paz, why now? Um, it, because we can't wait till tomorrow. Uh, I, I think that there is a coalition. I think people are looking around. I think they see the mass shootings. I, I wish they responded to the shootings in downtown Hartford just as they do to a mass shooting elsewhere. But I think it's raising people's awareness. I think people are beginning to realize that uh, some of these uh, safety measures do make a difference. And we got to do better. I think, as Steve said, I think people can see that all we're doing is trying to modernize and, and prevent those got folks who are trying to end run all of our gun safety rules to make sure they're as effective today as we tried to make them uh, 10, 20 years ago when they first passed. These uh, other weapons, as well as the pre-94 uh, uh, assault weapons that were uh, exempted, do we have any estimate as to how the number of weapons we're talking about? I know uh, state police said, you know, the pre, the, the, the weapons that were right, grandfathered into the most recent ban is about 800 something thousand. Do we have a number to compare that to in terms of what we're talking about here? In checking with uh, the Commissioner of Public Safety, there is no number. And a big part of that reason is because people are dodging. They're not registered. That's a problem. So the pre-1994 assault weapons um, do not have to be registered. They are permitted in the state of Connecticut. That's what might shock the residents of this state, is the pre-1994 manufactured assault weapons are legal. And sellers outside of our state know that, and they are selling these pre-ban assault weapons into our state, and people are possessing them. So this proposal says if you p possess a assault weapon pre-ban, you must register it with the state of Connecticut. On the rim fire, our statutes on assault weapons specifically say that center fire rifles along with other technical specifications, are prohibited. We have learned that um, rimfire rifles are increasingly being used and modified in order to bypass the assault weapon ban in Connecticut because their sim simple modification of where the pin in the gun strikes the cartridge makes an assault weapon uh, separate from our statutes. That's why it's being expanded. We want these weapons to come out of the dark. We want them to be, people can possess them, but they need to be able to register them with the state of Connecticut. Velocity rounds, 
223s were center fire. So are you saying that those high velocity rounds um, can be legally fired now just because of how they make that alteration? In the assault weapon ban language, it says center fire rifles. That's the way, essentially the way the assault weapons are structured is you have specific guns that are specified, and then you have descriptions of pistols, of, um, of rifles, and of shotguns. And based on whether the design of those guns meet the specifications, they fall under that statute. So uh, rimfire rifles are not mentioned in the statutes. So a rimfire rifle can be modified with other elements listed in our statutes and still not qualify. But if you look at it, it is an assault weapon that is being used. So every time there, you know, the 93 assault weapon ban um, got to more the mechanics of the guns, the features. What's the challenge still in writing legislation in this regard that uh, resists the workarounds? I, I think the, the resistance will continue to the statutes as they are developed, and that's why states like Connecticut and states across the country constantly have to update them because of innovations that are being carried out by manufacturers, um, by sellers, they look for ways to skirt the laws. And so we need to look at what the intention is of an assault weapons ban, of a policy on large capacity magazines, and make sure they're updated to reflect the guns that are being found. That's why Chief, Chief State's attorney cited the discovery of large capacity magazines and many of the crimes that are occurring in Connecticut. Same thing for ghost guns. The ep emphasis of these policies is laws that can be enforced. If there are existing laws that are unenforceable, practically unenforceable, or difficult to enforce, they need to be updated to keep our streets safe. Registering, there were guns that were legal or grandfathered before 1994. But what is the actual loophole? Are people buying parts and retrofitting these guns? What is what's the loophole? The loophole is that. Oh, pardon, oh, pardon. No, the, the loophole is that the statutes, as enacted, define what constitutes an assault weapon, and um, and there are elements of the statutes that just need to be updated so that we can enforce them effectively. And so we, we, when the law was passed regarding assault weapons, pre-ban assault weapons are, uh, are illegal to possess and to transfer and to have in the state of Connecticut. And so the, the proposal is to require individuals possessing a pre-ban assault weapon to register it, just as we do with post-94 uh, bans. all of them registered regardless of when they were Yes, that's correct. Excuse me. You guys have a set up for uh like all the, the, the killing on the street between 17 to 25 to distract the guys out there, give them something else to do, a second plan to, you know, to get them, keep them busy because they just killing each other, but they ain't got nothing to do. They ain't got no place to go. They, they, they just lost. Yeah. So you guys have a plan for that? That's one question. The second one, are you guys going to put zero eyes in the schools and in the hospitals? Zero eyes will be you spot the gun in advance on the person's body once they pull it out and, and let the... Uh, you guys know that somebody is armed? Yeah, no, no. I was just going to say, sir, we're limiting questions to the media, and we are happy to talk to you uh, afterward. But Compass uh, is, is a group that does exactly what you're saying. They are taking at-risk youth in Hartford and trying to get them on the right path and do very productive things with their time, help them with their schoolwork, with job training and all of that. And we're happy to talk more with you after. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, the photo you received is, as Mark described, when the initial uh, assault weapon ban was put forward, they specifically defined types of firearms. Um, and as the gentleman up here explained, as these laws uh, are put into place, the manufacturing of the firearms evolve as the legislation needs to evolve. Um, so what the pictures of what you received are currently exempt under the assault weapon ban in the state of Connecticut by the configuration. Um, so the current legislation that's being put forward today is to include that style or um, that configuration in the assault weapon ban. So there are certain things on that, on that modified. Can you just say what those are? 
Sure, so on the top photo that you have, um, it's considered a Connecticut other. It has what's called a buffer tube on the back, um, and it's not intended to be shouldered. The second, the firearm on the bottom, that has a stabilizer on it, also not intended to be shouldered. And then there's a picture of just an arm brace in between those two. On the left hand side. On the left hand side, yep. So those are, those are just attachments that go on the back. It's a rearward attachment. Um, it's not a stock, so that's where um, it becomes intended to be shouldered to make it a rifle or a shotgun. These, these are not intended for that. Were those by state police recently, or where, where are these? Those were in our vault inventory. I don't know the circumstances off the top of my head why we have them. I'm sorry, did they get they're in our firearms vault. Uh, we take firearms in for various reasons, so I can't specify specifically why I took them into the vault. Can you say your name? Uh, I'm Detective Bryn, B-R-I-N, Warenda, W-A-R-E-N-D-A. Sergeant Brianna, B-R-I-A-N-N-A, Maurice, M-A-U-R-I-C. -E. We good? Thanks, everybody. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 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 Thank you.